Welcome to the Health Babes Podcast with Drs. Becky Campbell and Crystal Holm, where we talk everything health. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Health Babes Podcast. Today, we have Laura Bryden on. She is a naturopathic doctor, and she is the author of the best-selling books, Period Repair Manual and Hormone Repair Manual. She has 25 years experience in women's health and currently has consulting rooms in Christchurch, New Zealand, where she treats women with PCOS, PMS, endometriosis, perimenopause, and many other hormone and period related health problems. Let's get started. Hey, everybody. Let's welcome Dr. Laura Bryden. So she's going to talk today about different types of hormonal issues. And really, we're going to focus on the birth control pill and birth control methods. So I'm super excited to have you today. We've been dying to to record and air this episode. So welcome. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah. So let's talk about, you know, what is your story? What got you interested in the topic of hormones in the first place? Hmm. As you probably know, I'm pretty passionate about hormones. I think some of it started with my first career way back, like 30 years ago, I was an evolutionary biologist. I published a paper about the sex differences in foraging behavior in animals. And so I had this, I've had this biologist lens on health for a long time and you know, sort of see things that way that, for example, I've, I see that the female body, you know, is a healthy biological system that functions. This is the way it's supposed to work. So after, you know, after that career, I became, I trained as a naturopathic doctor 25 years ago and started out in general practice, but very quickly started seeing a lot of women and women who were wanting alternatives to hormonal birth control, women who had symptoms like PCOS and endometriosis and perimenopause and, you know, bad skin and premenstrual mood sy- symptoms and all the things and really needing alternatives. And I found, which I'm sure you can attest to that women's bodies respond really well. Some of these symptoms respond really well to simple, natural treatments, diet changes and supplements, and sometimes herbal medicines and sometimes natural hormones. And so I pretty much did that work for full time for about 20 years and then wrote my first book, Period Repair Manual, which got a great response around the world, which was amazing. It's it's been translated into several different languages. And of course, women in all those different languages are all saying the same thing. You know, some of these simple things work for periods. And so that kind of brings me up to today where I'm still very passionate about, yeah, helping women's bodies do what they are meant to do. I love that. That's what we really focus on too. And so that kind of leads me into my next question. You know, we were talking a little bit off air about how the birth control pill is prescribed in teenagers, you know, and, and adult women for issues like acne or painful periods and metriosis, you know, you name it. I feel yeah, like it's the band-aid. It. It's the go-to for anything, it every, is. anything and everything. Yeah. Yeah. And the problem is, is that, you know, in our practice, we see so many people who won't, can't get their period after getting off of it. And, you know, the post birth control syndrome, which we'll get into a little bit later. And, you know, I do feel like parents of these teenagers are not fully given the real information on their side effects and, or the women, you know, who are taking them, they're just not educated very well on what all the ins and outs of this. So can you kind of talk us through like the different types of hormonal birth control and what you see with that? Yeah, let's, yes, for sure. We'll, we'll talk about all of that. And you're right. There is an issue around informed consent when it comes to hormonal birth control There's actually a bit of discussion about that, that a lot of women and parents of girls don't really understand what they're signing up for. So the the most, the thing, the place I like to start is just to say very clearly that pill bleeds are not menstrual cycles. So I know this, this is something that was going to come up later in our conversation, but I kind of want to lead with it because one in three of all the women who, and girls who take the pill, one in three take it to regulate their cycle which is one of those crazy emperor's new clothes situations because it can't actually do that because combined methods of hormonal birth control work by switching off ovarian function temporarily and inducing what really can only be described as a temporary chemical menopause. 
and then replacing the hormones that we would make with a menstrual cycle with contraceptive drugs, which are not the same as our bodies on hormones. And that's where a lot of the actually side effects and some of the potential long-term risks from hormonal birth control come from that, you know, that difference between real hormones and contraceptive drugs. And then this sort of this whole narrative of, you know, have this regular drug withdrawal induced bleed and therefore you know, that's a period. And, and that is just wrong on so many levels. And one of the thing, reasons this matters, particularly for young women and teenagers, is that the, the a healthy, approximately monthly menstrual cycle, it doesn't have to be monthly in a teenager, actually, it could be every 45 days as normal in a teenager, but that approximate monthly ovulation is an indicator of health. This, you're probably aware of it. There's a, there was a 2016 statement by the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists called the menstrual cycle as a vital sign. It was really radical. It was just, I I talk about it in my book. I was just, I almost cried when I read that statement. They were basically saying, you know, in young women, we need to, they need to get their periods. We need to see that that's happening, that their body's working. And if, so that's why they recommend that doctors ask young women and teenagers about their periods. And by periods, they mean natural menstrual cycles. They say something like, because by doing so, you know, we'll communicate to, girls that the a natural cycle is an important expression of health. So that's kind of my starting place. You know, I feel like we're in this paradigm. Oh, it, it feels like it's always been this way, but it's really only been 60 or 70 years where it's the norm to take these drugs to induce a, a temporary chemical menopause in young women. And I have very little doubt that future generations will look back at this and think, what the heck? Like, what was, what were they doing? Just like we do for a lot of things in medicine, we kind of look back 50 years or hundred years and think, whoa, <laughs> that was not good. And I'm, so I call this, you know, the paradigm, the, the era of contraceptive drugs, we're sort of, we're locked in a paradigm right now. It's not going to be forever. And the right, I sort of feel like the writing's on the wall, actually, that women need their own, we, we need our own, our own hormones. We need natural menstrual cycle cycling. That's part of health. And that's going to become more apparent as the research around that grows and grows actually. Yeah. And I think the more, you know, people are educated just because again, like parents, women, you know, take mostly women are taking their daughters to get this because they're so, they feel so bad for them, let's say for their acne yeah. and it's, they have no clue no clue what this long-term effect is going to be or what it's actually doing in their body. Well, and we're just starting to see, I can talk a little bit about some of the evidence, the kind of worrying evidence about what that might be doing to young women. But first of all, let me just say, neither of us are, we're not suggesting that teenagers or young women just put up with symptoms like painful periods or heavy flow or skin problems. Of course, like that needs, they need to be helped. Those symptoms need to be, addressed. And there are some quite straightforward at times mm-hmm. alternative solutions. So I'll just give one example, which is, it's so boring and <laughs> so simple, but therapeutic dose of zinc supplement, which would be, I would say is 30 milligrams a day, which I'll just comment really does need to be taken with food or it can make cause nausea, but zinc appropriately taken can It's excellent for skin, both skin and period pain. And actually there's a clinical trial out there where they used, they put zinc head to head with the pill for period pain. And they found that they concluded that zinc works as well as the pill for period pain. And I always cite that study because I I just, I had to smile when the, I was reading the discussion part of that paper because the researchers said, oh, and well, the advantage of zinc is that it's less expensive than the pill. Like it's more affordable. And I was thinking, well, sure there's that. And also the fact that it doesn't shut down ovarian function and induce chemical menopause is also that (laughs) there's the fact that zinc, you know, works with the body and can relieve symptoms. So yeah, I'll just say, I mean, obviously that's the core of my work and my books is trying to provide other solutions, but I might just speak a little bit to some of the evidence of some of the long-term effects that are we're only just starting to see in the research because there's also this narrative, oh, the pill is safe. And 
really what they're talking about when they say that it's always in science, as you know, it's always, what was the question they were asking when they came to this conclusion? So, you know, by safe, they're looking very broadly at like how many women, you know, die on hormonal birth control versus those who don't like big questions like that. And of course, some women do die on hormonal birth control, but fortunately that's rare. But some of the other questions are the ones that interest me. So for example, around mood, specifically. So for literally generations, decades, women were saying these drugs affect our mood. And then the medical consensus was saying, no, they don't. You're imagining that, which is actually a little concerning in itself. But finally, again, around, it was actually 2016, it was kind of a big year for periods. That was the same year that the big Danish study came out that tracked like 1.1 million women and girls and did find a signal or a correlation of all types of hormonal birth control and negative mood outcomes. And then there have been smaller studies that looked at that a little more closely. And the one that sticks in my mind is there was a Canadian study where they found that was, again, it was a correlation and not a causation study, but they found that women who had taken hormonal birth control when they were teenagers, but then stopped it, had an increased risk. I think it was d- triple the risk of anxiety and depression than women who had never taken hormonal birth control as teenagers. And even though it was a correlation study, the authors of in the discussion, the authors of that study say, well, this is biologically plausible because hormones affect the brain, especially during that key adolescent phase when the brain is calibrating itself, basically wiring itself. And they're like, well, hormones affect the brain. So it makes sense that these hormone-like drugs affect the brain. And actually we know from other studies that women on hormonal birth control, adult women have altered brain structures compared to women who are cycling naturally. So you just start to get a picture of some of the evidence that's coming out now. And yeah, it's concerning, which which is why I'm so passionate about helping, (laughs) trying to help young women find another solution. Yeah. And we see a lot of people who just really struggle for, you know, I mean, don't get, don't get a menstrual cycle for years after getting off of it. So, well, that's a, that's a concern because as you know, I mean, well, there's lots of problems with not cycling, not ovulating, not making hormones. Yeah. It's, it's Yeah. And especially when they want to get pregnant, you know, and they're, they had no clue that being on birth control for 20 years would be a problem. Then they get off and they, they're like, okay, ready to get pregnant. And they don't even, they can't even get their cycle back, you know? So. Yeah. Well, we could talk about that a little bit if you want Yeah, the way to, yeah. So that's, that's an experience that can happen. So, so just to be clear, I mean, some women come off the pill and boom, they start oh, ovulating yeah. and there's no problems at all. So just to acknowledge that that happens as well. And then, um, but there is some research, um, actually there was a paper looking at the kind of lag time for different methods of hormonal birth control, how long it takes on average to start to ovulate again, because keep in mind, there's no ovulation on the pill or on, so any, on any combined method, almost any method, actually, the only method of hormonal birth control that permits ovulation is the hormonal IUD, which is a little quirky actually, because you can still be cycling pretty normally on the hormonal IUD, but actually not see a bleed. So one of the things I like to the, the compare and contrast that I like to talk about sometimes is on the pill or NuvaRing or combined estrogen method, women bleed, but don't cycle. So there's these fake, it not fake, they're real bleeds, but like induced bleeds, but don't cycle. Whereas on the hormonal IUD, women oddly can be cycling, but not bleeding, which is kind of a, almost the opposite. But back to the question of like not getting your period when you stop a combined method. So one thing to just be really clear, you go from having a withdrawal, a forced drug withdrawal bleed, which was not a period to then like your body, giving your body a chance, like, okay, now can you actually do it? Can you actually cycle? So a lot of women will say, oh, I lost my period when I came off the pill, but they're not losing anything. Like that wasn't a period. It was, which is actually one of the concerns about being on a combined method and the forced bleeds is you're potentially masking whatever the underlying problem was. So a a possible scenario is a a common reason for not getting a period is under eating, which unfortunately is becoming more and more common. 
but that can be masked. Like you could be not eating enough to get to ovulate or have a period, but if you're on the combined pill, you can, that can force you to have a monthly bleed and be kind of reassuring. It's like, Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm fine for 20 years. It's like, actually, no, you were never fine. Or there could be other underlying reasons for that as well. One of the things that as a, for myself, as a clinician, when I'm trying to help women and maybe sort of predict or understand what might happen when they come off, when they stop having pill bleeds or withdrawal bleeds is to ask them, what were your periods like before you started the pill? Well, two things really, what were your, like, did you have any real natural cycles before you started the pill? And how how young were you when you started it? Because another part of all of this is that it takes, can take up to 12 years to mature the menstrual cycle. So if a girl gets her period at 13, I mean, her cycle is not mature yet. She's having a few bleeds. She's probably not ovulating yet. Her, her, the communication between the brain and the ovaries is just getting going. It's going to take several years to mature and start to make a strong, what's called a luteal phase. And you'll start to make good levels of progesterone, which is why incidentally, actually girls at that age can have heavier periods for a while because they haven't, they're not hormonally mature yet. They're not making the progesterone they need to naturally light and flow. So it can take up until about 25 to be fully fertile, if you will, which is probably why 25 is peak fertility in <laughs> in a natural sense. But, um, and then, but if you, so I'll ask my patients, it's like, if they tell me, so they're like, what is it going to be like when I stop the pill? Am I going to get my period? It's like, well, the first thing I want to say is ask them is how old were you when you started the pill? And if they say like 13, as soon as I got my period, I had pain and skin. So I went on the pill. I'm like, okay, wow. Well, you've never had an ovulatory mens like proper sort of menstrual cycle. So your body has not really learned to do that. So it's possible normal when you stop these ovulation suppressing drugs that your body might then have to go, okay, wait, let's try to, Ooh, let's try to figure this out. And it can make sense, right. That it can take a while for the body, like several months, maybe, or even longer for the body to figure that out. And it's not, I don't know, you probably, if you work with women, you know, the sort of default with women is, oh, I'm broken. Oh, it's something I've done. It's something, you know, I'm eating or something I'm doing wrong, or it's me or I'm broken. And what I like to say to my patients and what I say in my book, it's not necessarily anything wrong with you. It's, this is a withdrawal syndrome from it's the problem is what's wrong is, you know, the drug that you were given and the way that suppressed your, the maturation of your menstrual cycle. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's what I try to explain to people. Like your body's trying to figure out where it's going right now. (laughs) Yeah. And, and also just to say, you you don't want to just let that kind of guess at that and just think, oh, that must be what's happening and, and go too long. I mean, I think as a general guideline, what I usually say is, you know, give it a few months when you stop the pill. Like don't, you know, don't worry too soon. Give it a, give it a few months. Understand that you could be fertile at any point in that time, even if you don't, even before you see a bleed, right? Because ovulation happens first and then a bleed. But then after, if it's been three or four months and there's nothing, no sign of a period, then it, it is important to be assessed at that point by, you know, by the doctor or a naturopathic doctor to have some blood tests, to try to do the detective work that's required for understanding what is going on? What is the explanation? Because it it's often, I mean, it's not enough to just say, oh, the explanation is that you've just stopped the pill. I mean, there could be something with, you know, prolactin or PCOS or thyroid or different, all the different things that can affect periods. So that's pretty important to do. And then, and I have sections in my book called, you know, how to speak with your doctor about this, how to get the testing, like how to say, why am I not ovulating, like, because there's always a reason, right? The body wants to ovulate. That's my biologist self coming in. And so of course, as part of that conversation, you, you don't want to just end up with another script for the pill. Like you, you want an explanation that you can then work with, um, and try to fix. And it's not enough to just say, oh, well, either take the pill or take these fertility drugs. And that's the whole solution. I mean, there's, there's usually other solutions, not that I'm you know, I'm not saying I'm against fertility medication if that's what's required, but there's usually often a way to get the body to ovulate on its yeah. own. It wants to something else driving it. Yeah, for sure. 
So we were talking earlier, and I've seen you talk about this a lot with the IUD, the Marina IUD, how it's kind of advertised as a progesterone. Right. Um, (laughs) Yeah. um, You know, that it's just progesterone. So, you know, a lot of people will even say, you know, what do you think about the Marina? It's just progesterone. And I've even had back, you know, when I was way before I did any of this, I had the Marina and the doctor explained it to me as, well, it's just progesterone and it's just localized to the area of where it's inserted. Yeah. So you talk about progesterone and progestins. The difference. Yeah. So can yes. you explain that? This is one of the most important parts of the conversation. And a lot of my work is about using the right words for things. So, you know, it's not like there are times when taking a progestin is okay. You know, it's, it's certainly maybe the best option, but it's not progesterone. Yeah. There's no progesterone in any type of hormonal birth control. And I guess the thing to say is that what's, what makes this a little, I can understand why doctors and journalists and even researchers sometimes like researchers less often, but are getting confused about this. Actually, I had a doctor chime into my Instagram a couple of weeks ago, talking, you know, in the comments, talking to another doctor. And I was talking about the difference between progestin and progesterone. And she was saying, yeah, I'm a doctor. and I only kind of learned this two years ago. So they don't, wow, yeah. they, a lot of them do genuinely when they say progesterone, they think that's the right word, but it's not. So one thing to say is that estrogen is a generic term, which can refer to our main estrogen in our body, which is called estradiol. That's the precise term for the estrogen we make in our cycles. And then there's a synthetic estrogen in most types, you know, many types of hormonal birth control called ethanol estradiol, which is not the same as estradiol, but the term estrogen can accurately refer to any type of estrogen. Whereas progesterone is not a generic term. So progesterone refers to very precisely one molecule, like one type of molecule, a human hormone that we make after ovulation and during in huge amounts during pregnancy, it's called progesterone. And that's the only thing that, that can be called that all the other progesterone like drugs are progestins and there are many of them, right? Like this, and you can just read the packet and just read the label of your birth control. And you can see whether it's levonorgestrel or drosperinone, or there's, you know, all different ones. And they all have slightly different effects in the body. And they're all, they all have different effects than progesterone. Well, it's interesting because actually really the only way that they're, a lot of those drugs are similar to progesterone, to real progesterone is that they thin the uterine lining and at a certain dose will prevent ovulation. I mean, that's the, that's kind of where the similarities stop. Then you start to get all the differences between progestin and progestins and progesterone of which a few examples could be, for example, a a really common progestin, the one that's in the hormonal IUD, levonorgestrel, it's in some of the implants, it's in a lot of pills. It's derived from testosterone. So it's actually more, in some ways, more similar to testosterone than it is to progesterone, which is why it can cause skin breakouts and cause hair loss in some women. Whereas progesterone actually has natural anti-androgen or kind of anti-testosterone effects, which is why real progesterone can be used to treat PCOS. That's part of something called cyclic progesterone therapy, which I wrote a paper about. So that's one example. I just give give another example. A lot of the progestins now we're finding are in the research, finding that they're not great for mood or potentially it's the progestin part of hormonal birth control. That's probably the biggest problem for mood. Whereas progesterone in general is quite beneficial for mood, even though some women have almost a paradoxical reaction to it and can get a negative mood reaction. But in general, real progesterone is quite good for mood. That's another example. I mean, one more example is that all progestins, just be careful how I say this, all progestins slightly increase the risk of breast cancer. I mean, slightly. So not to, you know, again, not to scare anyone, but whereas 
progesterone, real progesterone, most of the evidence points to the fact that it probably reduces the risk of breast cancer. So that's just a few, a sampler of some of the differences. And yeah. cardiovascular health too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some progestins are a cardiovascular risk. Um, real progesterone is not actually, it doesn't carry any of the sort of clotting risk or cardiovascular risk that's associated with synthetic with estrogen, oral estrogen or oral synthetic estrogen or progestins. So you talk about the different signs of progesterone deficiency. Do you want to go through? Yeah. Well, the first, the most basic body literacy, do your listeners know that term? Do you think it's so body literacy is, I just think it's, I love it. I have like a little essay on my blog post on my blog about um, written by Laura Wischler, who is the inventor of that term. It's about it. Basically she would define it as understanding if, and when you're ovulating and therefore making progesterone. So the first thing to say about progesterone is the only way to make it is by ovulating and, and then by being pregnant, being during pregnancy that you make a huge amount, but like ovulation comes first, obviously. So in a cycle in a natural menstrual cycle, you have no progesterone before ovulation. And then if you can ovulate, if, and when you ovulate, then you make approximately two weeks of progesterone if you're healthy. So that's a, you know, that's a basic guideline. I have a a blog post called the right way to test progesterone. And the reason this is important is because let's say you have a longer cycle, like in a young woman, like a 45 day cycle, she's only going to be making progesterone from like day 30 of her cycle to day 45 kind of thing. Right. Like, so there's no point if you do a day 21 progesterone blood test on that woman, like, and you find none, that doesn't mean she's progesterone deficient or not ovulating. It just means she has a longer cycle and you measured it at the wrong time. So that's, I really like to try to get that information out there. And also the other thing to understand as part of body literacy, it's possible and actually not unusual to have what's called an anovulatory cycle. So to have, be having even, you know, either irregular or even somewhat regular bleeds when there was no ovulation, just only estrogen, but no progesterone. And that's not ideal. That's, I mean, it's okay to have the occasional cycle like that because most of us do, but that would be the state of, for example, PCOS or polycystic ovary syndrome has a lot of anovulatory cycles and that's not good. So that's just a bit of body literacy to understand the, the best way to actually identify progesterone, I think is to track temperatures because with a, if you're taking a basal body temperature, so a, a a thermometer under your tongue first thing in the morning while you're still in bed, that's your resting temperature. It has to be at the same time every morning approximately, but then you you do get, you could pick up the signal of from ovulation about a day after ovulation when progesterone goes up because progesterone raises temperature, you see this slight about 0.3 degrees Celsius, or I think it's about 0.5 degrees Fahrenheit rise in temperature that stays high for the two weeks of the luteal phase. So that's a really good way to just yourself confirm that progesterone is being made typically with low progesterone or a short luteal phase or insufficient progesterone. Obviously you won't see that sustained temperature rise. That's one of the signs you can start to see fertile mucus, which is that clear stretchy discharge. You can start to see that in the luteal phase. So normally that should only happen with ovulation and then you know, that type of mucus should dry up, although it's okay to see kind of a creamy discharge in the luteal phase. You can, you can get spotting in the luteal phase and then of course, yeah, no temperature rise or, and, or low progesterone when timed, when tested at the right time. So what do you recommend if someone does have low progesterone? Yeah. Well, then it goes back to what is the obstacle to ovulation? So there's not, which makes sense, right? There's not one way to ovulate because ovulation is an ovulation and the making of, of a good amount of progesterone is a reflection of overall health. So it means that all the different things that could have kind of gone wrong didn't happen. So that could be just to give it examples of reasons for either no ovulation or kind of less robust ovulation, less progesterone, shorter luteal phase, all the reasons for that. I mean, there's, many, many that we couldn't all list today, but like, for example, common ones would be high androgens or that high kind of male hormone, or that's the state of polycystic ovary syndrome or PCOS under eating can do that. Underactive thyroid can do that. Having borderline high levels of something called prolactin can do that. Stress can 
can impair ovulation to some extent, either suppress ovulation or create a less robust luteal phase. Any nutritional deficiency, which is like, basically you have to be fully nourished in every way to be able to get there. Gluten sensitivity can be an explanation, which is not to say that just to be really clear, most women do not have gluten sensitivity, but for those, I would say maybe one in 20 women who have a quite pronounced, even non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that can be a reason. I think one of the, it's one of the first patient stories in period repair manual, forgetting what her name was. I think it's Christine. And in that story who she, this is in my book period repair manual, she had, but always been having like these three month cycles and often an ovulatory and her doctor had said, Oh, that's just the way you are. But she also, in her case, had some signs of gluten sensitivity, like psoriasis and I think migraines and forgetting the exact details of her case. And then I'm like, wow, okay, well that all that's pointing to probably the fact that you need to try some time strictly off gluten. She wasn't celiac, but still gluten sensitive. And so in her case, she came off and then came off gluten. And then like six months later was having regular cycles and robust luteal phases. So just to be clear, I'm giving that as an example of, you know, fix your underlying health and that'll fix your period. That doesn't mean that every person who's having short luteal phases or low progesterone needs to come off gluten, right? It's the opposite of that. It's like, you need to try to figure out what is the thing. And I know that that can, that requires some detective work. Some of that detective work can be done on your own, but some requires the help, hopefully of a good clinician who can ask some of those questions of what is going on. Why are you, you know, what are the other clues from your health that might tell us why you're not ovulating and making a good level of progesterone? Yeah. I love that because I think people are so quick to put people on hormone replacement therapy without looking into any of the factors of why their hormones are low. Um, and people always ask me, well, do you believe in hormone replacement therapy? And I'm like, not without looking in other areas first. Um, I think there's a time and a place for it. And then there's uh, just, you know, there's all those clinics, the anti-aging clinics where they just give everybody hormone replacement therapy, you know, really without any diet, you know, any background on, you know, checking what's going on with the thyroid or the adrenal glands or, you know, like you said, gluten or whatever, you know, all all the things that we know that can lead to this. And that's the thing that I'm not for. So with that kind of segue, I wanted to know what is your opinion on hormone replacement therapy? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Good question. So what we're talking about right now is the use of the modern word, I guess would be body identical hormone therapy, which would be using progesterone, real progesterone, which I'll just be clear, like in the States. So this, we're not, again, we're not talking about hormonal birth control in the, in the U S the brand the common brand that you can get by prescription is called Prometrium. In other countries, it's called Eutrogestin. It has different names. I have a list of brand names on my blog, or you can get it compounded. That's what you know. What is sometimes called natural progesterone. Although I often encourage patients in my readers, I say, don't use the word, don't necessarily use the word natural progesterone with your doctor if you're trying to get this from a normal doctor because they respond a lot better to just saying Prometrium. So we're talking about either you know progesterone on its own and or you know with estradiol, that's our natural estrogen and often in the form of a patch. Okay. So, you know, when is it appropriate to take those hormones? Well, there's actually several different situations when I think it can be helpful to take them. One of them I referred to just briefly earlier, which is actually taking what's called cyclic progesterone therapy for PCOS at times. Like if it's a properly diagnosed PCOS, I would say not as a standalone treatment, but if you've also done diet and the nutritional supplement and inositol and some of the mm-hmm. other things, and if you if it's a really you know kind of tough case and you need some help getting the androgens down, cyclic progesterone therapy can be helpful. And so that's a case of using so-called natural hormone therapy for that. That's one situation. Another situation where it is actually under eating. So that would be either hypothalamic amenorrhea or relative energy deficiency in sport, depending on, it's the same thing. That just means not eating enough to get your period. And of course, the main solution for that is to eat more, like way, way, way more. I think women very, very much underestimate how much calorie, how many calories they need to get their period. So the main evidence-based treatment for that condition is to eat more. But also at the same time, if the, if that's been, if that situation had been going on for some years and there's concerns about bone health, 
then it is an evidence-based approach to give body identical estradiol and progesterone, such as Prometrium, as an interim kind of bridging, just to put that in place, give the body, the bones some support, give the body some support while the refueling or the, the refeeding is happening. So that's another example. Another example is using real progesterone to lighten flow, which I talk a lot about in my second book, Hormone Repair Manual. This is particularly in women in their 40s. So above, yeah, after 40, yeah, some of this, it, it becomes harder to ovulate basically where that's the second puberty or perimenopause. It's normal for just to make less progesterone at that point, to be, you know, to find it harder to make progesterone. That's part of the process of second puberty. So during that time, some women can really benefit from taking progesterone to lighten flow and also help prevent migraines and help with sleep. And that approach so that might be, for example, choosing to use something like Prometrium rather than the hormonal IUD or other progestin drug that's offered for the purpose of lightening flow. That's another example. And I have in my in hormone repair manual, I have like several how to speak with your doctor sections about how to sort of orient towards that and orientate towards that and get, you know, get that prescription. And then of course, then then there's menopause and the decision to take natural body identical hormone therapy, which is the conventional hormone therapy these days, which is so awesome. So good. It's not like 25 years ago when I started out and everyone was on these, I'll just say horrid drugs that were again, kind of hormone like, but not real hormones back then. So modern hormone therapy is body identical or exactly identical to it is estradiol and progesterone. So that there's a case to be made for taking that in menopause because of course you can no longer make progesterone or very much estradiol after with menopause after the final period you can you still make the body still makes actually quite a lot of estrogen but um yeah there's there's a case to be made i talk about that in quite a lot of detail in hormone repair manual the you know whether to take menopausal hormone therapy or not yeah cuz you don't i mean i'm sure you probably don't believe everyone in menopause needs No, at the same time, I think it can be quite helpful for some people. So I really am. Yeah, I'm very open. I think I think it can be helpful. I think not all women need it. And also not all women can even take estrogen. So there's that factor as well. So there's there's other Yeah, we probably don't have time to go into all the, you know, pros and cons and ins and outs of uh, menopausal hormone therapy, you can have me back for that. (laughs) That would be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So what are some other options of birth control that are non-hormonal? Yeah. Good question. Obviously because avoiding pregnancy is an important goal for you know women of any, any age and teenagers. I'll just say, okay, I'll talk about what we've got currently in terms of options and what's potentially coming. So there is some, well, first I'll talk about that first. There's some uh, uh, finally a little bit of research happening around some male methods of contraception. I just actually shared something about that on Instagram yesterday. Um, It's actually a whole series of, if anyone's interested, there's a whole series called Intended. It's a podcast series about the journey to male birth control, which is pretty fascinating. So yeah, I think men can pick up some of this slack, which actually makes sense because as just as a basic fact, men are fertile every day. So are in a way kind of the more logical target for birth control. Whereas as women, we're only fertile essentially six days per cycle, really actually technically only one day per cycle, but you add on five days because sperm lives for five days. So that's where the six days comes from. So most of the time in our cycle, we cannot become pregnant, which is actually kind of like people, if they didn't know this, this is part of body literacy again, if they, you know, just to understand it's like, wow, okay, this is the way the body works. So in terms of what how can we avoid pregnancy? So I'll just talk through, I mean, the first thing is, there's a whole set of methods called the fertility awareness-based methods that work on that principle that we're not fertile most of the cycle. And you, you cannot just guess what those days are truly like you, you, there needs to, there's a few ways to objectively measure that temperature is a a great way to do that. You have to either kind of learn how to do that, which is taking training in fertility awareness method, or there's, a few algorithm sort of devices out there. I'll mention one by name because I quite like it. This is something called Daisy, which is a little computer thermometer that will give you, you take your temperature and then it gives you a red, green, or yellow light. If it 
if it gives you a green light that day, then you, you can confidently know that you cannot become pregnant that day. If it gives you a yellow light, it's not sure, which means you should, it, yeah, <laughs> you could become pregnant. <laughs> if it gives you a red light, it means, yeah, you could definitely become pregnant. I think this has a red flashing light as well, which is, okay, this is the day when you, yeah, <laughs> you, you know, you either abstain or you just be very, very careful because that's your super fertile day. So there's that whole side of things. And that's actually becoming a lot more popular, which is great to see. Then there are condoms, which I'm a huge fan of. I have sort of a generational thing happening here where when I was a, I was having sex as a teenager, I'll admit it when I was a teenager. And then in my, you know, a young woman, we, a lot of us relied on condoms back then. Condoms were a way to prevent pregnancy. That's just a thing. Whereas some of my young patients today seem to have this idea narrative that condoms don't work. And I think that's sad because I think condoms do, well, they do work. And just as anyone who's sitting there thinking, well, what about a broken condom or a failed condom? One thing to point out, well, first of all, if you're, if you're combining that with fertility awareness method, and if you know that the broken condom happened at a time that you were not fertile at all, then you don't have to worry. But also for what it's worth, I do think the morning after pill with a plan B is a reasonable, like making sure young women have access to that is a reasonable backup for a condom. And just to be clear that that works by preventing ovulation, that medication. So it's like, if, even if you only had to do that once in two years or something, it's essentially the same. It's a lot of them, I think are leaving a gestural. It's the same drug that's in hormonal birth control, but just a bigger dose. But it's like, in my thinking, well, you're taking it one time in two years rather than daily. So, you know, that's might be a time for an ovulation suppressing drug. I have to tell you something. Yeah. I got pregnant with my first child with a condom. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Okay. Fair enough. Oh, so did, I did, it, did, it, did it fail? After pill. It broke. All right. So it broke. It broke. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay. Well, if there's a broken condom during a fertile window, yeah, there has to, that's when the morning yeah. after pill would come in for sure. I've been pregnant three, all of my kids were from a form of birth control. I literally am the most oh. fertile person. On the yeah, some women, it's true. Some women are a lot more fertile than others. There's yeah. always that as well. And to be fair, any method can fail technically. Yeah. It was even the, the, pill, even the, the second t- one was the pill and the yeah. third was with the um, vasectomy. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh yeah. no, you are super fertile. Okay. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, all right. So fair enough. So that's, that's a reality. I'll just talk through a couple of the other non-hormonal methods. So there, there is also the copper IUD or the non-hormonal IUD, which I'm not a, you know, I wouldn't say I'm a huge fan of it, but to, for what it's worth, it does not interfere with ovulation, does not shut down ovulation. And some women like it. It's, um, just to be clear, like it's a, it's an in-office insertion procedure. Like it's not surgery. Yeah. Although sometimes it's done under general, but a lot of times, a lot of doctors will just do it under a local anesthetic. Yeah. I had that and it just, they just did it. Yeah. They just in the office, the doctor's just like, here you go. (laughs) Yeah. So some women, some women really like it and it has downsides. I have a blog post called the pros and cons of the copper IUD. So people can kind of, they can look at that and read through it. So that, I mean, for what it's worth, it, it still feels a little kind of old school and a bit barbaric, actually that method, but <laughs> it is one of the few non-hormonal hormonal methods we have. And I know right. a couple of my naturopathic doctor friends who that's the method they choose. So that's out there. Then um, where are we at? I mean, there's a couple of uh, cervical cap and diaphragms, kind of more modern versions of those. Those are barrier methods, mm-hmm. female barrier methods. They're not great in terms of effect efficacy, but, um, they're out there. And then there's, I guess, technically I would put the hormonal IUD just almost on this category in that, as I explained earlier in the podcast, you can still cycle and kind of ovulate on the hormonal IUD. So it's, although it is hormonal, it's a little different than the other hormonal methods that work by shutting down hormones. So, yeah. And you have a great blog. I mean, she has, you guys have to check her blog and I'm going to ask you to give us um, some places to find you in a minute, but she has such great articles that really educate you on all these, these different things that go, you know, a lot more than we were able to into today. But so with that said, where, you know, where can people find you? Tell us both of your books, your website. I know you have a great Instagram page. Yep, for sure. So thanks. So I'm easy to find. Everything is Lara Bryden. So larabryden.com, 
all my social media is at Lara Bryden. I have a a little podcast and YouTube channel now, which is bite-sized things, I would call it. So it's like me giving little 12 minute explanations about various topics. So you can dip into some of the content that way as well. What's the name of that? I mean, I listen uh, to it. Yeah. The Lara Bryden podcast or Lara Bryden's podcast. So easy to find. Yes. And of course my, um, of course my book that I have mentioned a few times, but I'll say again is period repair manual that, you know, combines all of that information and puts that all in one place. Well, that's so great. Okay. Well, thank you so much. So I'm sure everyone's going to, um, if you guys go on to her Instagram and you go into her, uh, I think you use link tree, right? Um, the clickable yeah, I have a link. links. Yeah, yeah. There's all that, a, a lot of really great stuff in there. So that's, that's probably one of the easiest ways to find her. And she has a great Instagram page. I look at it all the time. So <laughs> And thank you so much yeah. for coming on today. We've This has been a great episode and I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to explain everything so well. Thanks so much for having me, Becky. It was great chatting. Yeah. And thank you everyone for listening. Have a great day. 